Thank you very much for that very kind introduction. Uh, I think it's been a fantastic seminar so far. I really have found it to be quite provocative and full of forward-thinking people. I've learned so much even in the last presentation, so thank you for inviting me. Uh, I was pleased to learn that uh, Dr. Johnson likes to sing to her patients because I do as well. <laughs> I usually insist that they're anesthetized before I start singing because <laughs> I fear that they'll wake up and go find another surgeon. <laughs> But as you heard, my interest in, in breast oncology has been to sort of raise the standard of care. Of course, we're all trying to do that, but I think the things that we're doing today you know, are not the things that we'll be doing in five, 10 years from now. We should always be looking forward to how to improve care and equally important, or perhaps more importantly, uh, to reduce the burden of care. Uh, we've had presentations that have talked about uh, you know, the fact that some patients want sort of maximally aggressive therapy. They want bilateral nipple spare mastectomy for DCS, DCS, which is not life limiting. Whereas some want to have the least therapy that they can get to solve the problem that they have to minimize the burden of therapy. So we have to think you know, in the context of personalized medicine, what the problem is, what the patient wants, and what tools we have to adapt to those scenarios. So I see cryoablation as one of the tools that surgeons can have in their toolkit to adapt the, the treatment to the problem, the problem based, the problem based upon its size, based upon its biology, and based upon the patient's wishes. So that's the, con the context in which I, I give this presentation on cryoablation and the management of early stage breast cancer. Uh, I must provide disclosures that I'm uh, funded by uh, Sonaris to uh, uh, lead the, uh, the FROST trial, which you have heard something about and which I will share with you. I also have some research support through Agendia, uh, in-kind support, which is also in incorporated into the FROST trial, which you'll hear about as well. Uh, the overview of the presentation will include a uh, discussion of the concept of cryoablation, uh, the technical aspects of the procedure, uh, I'll discuss briefly the ACASOG trial, which is a, a trial conducted by the American College of Surgeons, the first large study in the U.S. looking at the role of cryoablation in the treatment of early stage breast cancer. Uh, the FROST trial, which is a, a, a new trial that's ongoing, and I'll speak briefly about uh, some uh, interesting ideas about cryoimmuno cryoimmunology. Uh, my participation in this meeting is somewhat timely because two weeks ago I was in Japan attending the annual meeting of the Japan Society of the Low Temperature of Low Temperature Medicine. Now I went there with an interest in cryoablation, but in fact, uh, cryoablation for breast cancer, but uh, or cryoablation in the context of cancer. But as it turns out, a good part of the meeting was committed to cryopreservation of eggs for fertility, <laughs> which which I learned a lot about when I was there, as well as cryotherapy in the context of sports medicine, which I also learned a lot about. So it was quite uh, an instructive uh, experience for me. Uh, the meeting was held in a town called Kamagawa, uh, which is outside of Tokyo. Uh, it felt just like it felt when I arrived in. Uh, Portland last night, <laughs> rainy and cold, <laughs> and I was not in Tokyo, but in Kamagawa. But I had the opportunity to spend some time with uh, Dr. Fukuma, who was the chair of the meeting, and who uh, has been forward-thinking in the context of cryoblation for many years. In fact, I first visited him in 2009, when he was about to, uh, actually he had, he had been about one and a half years into conducting a clinical trial uh, evaluating the use of cryoblation in the treatment of early stage breast cancer. At that point, I had just joined the ACASOG trial, which I'll share with you in a moment, and I was interested in knowing his experience before I committed myself to joining the ACASOG trial. So this is my first interaction with him, but I had some time there at the meeting to, to interact further and to learn about his ongoing research, which, I, which I'll share at the end of the presentation. Uh, and in addition to spending time with him, I also had the chance to meet a number of other gentlemen, uh, people who are pioneers in the field. This actually just is a slide of uh, Dr. Fukuma's work that he had initially started. I'm not sharing you the results, but I'm sharing with you what was being examined when I first visited with him uh, some years ago. At that time, he was conducting a trial looking at the role of cryoblation in patients with luminal A, which is basically a, the least aggressive subtype of breast cancer that underwent a sentinel biopsy procedure, but the breast tumor was, was managed with cryoblation, not resection. Patients went on to have radiotherapy and endocrine therapy, and his goal was to determine over time uh, the local recurrence rate in patients treated with cryoblation. I'll share the current results with you at the end of the presentation. <laughs> But uh, 
I had the chance to meet for the first time these two gentlemen, uh, Dr. Niu and Dr. Zhu, and one additional gentleman by the name of uh, uh, Dr. Korpan, who have been pioneers in the field of cryoblation for a number of years. In fact, uh, as you notice, may have noticed from the previous slide, Dr. Zhu has been performing cryoblation for a number of years, and his single hospital has treated over 8,000 patients with cryoblation. Uh, for one cancer type or another. In fact, their interest is predominantly in treatment of pancreatic cancer, lung cancer, kidney cancers as an alternative surgery, not as an adjunctive surgery. And they produced some pretty, presented some pretty compelling results showing uh, how these, uh, how cryoblation stacked up against surgery and was sometimes better than surgery for treatment of these conditions. Uh, oddly enough, their interest in the treatment of breast cancer is primarily limited to treatment of locally advanced breast cancer because screening mammography is not widely used in their region of China, and so most women that come in with breast tumors have breast tumors that are too large or not early stage breast cancer, so they're treating, early, they're treating locally advanced as opposed to early stage breast cancer. So cryoblation, what is it? Well, I think you've already heard it's the concept of using uh, extremely cold temperatures for cancer therapy to destroy cancer. Cryo refers to icy cold, chilled, or frost, ablate to remove. So it's using, ideally, in the context of early stage breast cancer, I believe, a way of using extremely cold temperatures to treat a cancer without requiring its removal. Cryoblation is not new to oncology, as you've already heard. Even in the U.S., the NCCN guidelines has protocols and guidance regarding the use of cryoblation for treatment of metastatic and primary liver cancer, pancreatic cancer, kidney cancers, skin cancer, as well as colon cancer. Our use of cryoblation in treatment of breast diseases over the last 15 years has predominantly been limited to the treatment of fibroadenomas. Uh, there were no CPT, CPT codes or reimbursements for treatment of cancers, uh, but Although that was somewhat of a challenge, the biggest challenge to treatment of breast cancer with cryoblation was a cultural challenge, simply similar to what you heard before, that surgeons have generally thought that breast cancer required resection, even though we have some evidence that we could treat selected patients with ablation without resection. Uh, and it was the ACONSOC, the American College of Surgeons and College Group, that got surgeons to think more openly about the concept of treating breast cancer in the less aggressive, non-resection way, and uh, I'll share the results of that trial with you in a moment. So cryoblation works by basically three mechanisms. One is the physical formation of ice crystals within the cancer cells, which causes the cell membrane and the cell organelles to be disrupted. The formation of the crystals disrupts mechanically the cell membrane and, and, and organelles. That's the, the main or the initial effect. And this happens when the icicles form during the freezing thaw, during the freezing phase of the procedure. As you'll learn, there's a, the procedure is performed with a freeze phase, a thaw phase, and a freeze phase. So that initial phase is disruptive. Another aspect of it is that when icicles form outside of the cell in the intracellular spaces, the cells, the tissue uh, outside of the cells or the, the, the intercellular spaces become hypertonic, which causes water to flow out of the cells into the intercellular space. And during the thaw phase, the water reverses and flows back into the cells and disrupts the cells further. The cells shrink and then they sort of balloon out as they are filled with water that's flowing from the extracellular space back into the intracellular space. So those are the two main physical phenomena that lead to cellular damage. There's also a phenomenon that, is, that occurs in the microvasculature. Not only are the microvasculature cells directly damaged, but they also become thrombosed. They become clotted, and it produces an ischemic phenomenon which develops over subsequent days so that the tumor cells can be killed not only from the direct effect of ice formation on the cell itself, but also from the ischemic phenomenon of depriving the tumor from blood flow and oxygenation. So this is uh, the uh, schema for the ACOSOG trial, uh, which is a trial that enrolled women with tumors up to two centimeters, invasive cancer, and specifically ACE invasive ductal carcinomas. Uh, patients had at baseline mammography, ultrasound, and MRI. Let's see if I can get this to work. Nope, that's not it. The laser is here. Mammography, ultrasound, and MRI. Uh, they underwent ultrasound guided core biopsy of the tumor mass. 
Uh, they had MRI repeated after cryoablation. The primary purpose of MRIs here was to determine whether or not we could use MRI as a way of assessing whether or not the tumor was completely ablated or killed. And then approximately four weeks after cryoablation, all patients underwent surgical resection of the cryoablation site to confirm or to assess the degree of tumor ablation, tumor kill. Another consideration in the trial was to look at whether or not the process of cryoablation would induce an immune response that could be measured in the bloodstream. And so we obtained blood samples from prior to cryoablation, post cryoablation, and then after surgery to determine if there were measurable endpoints there. Cryoablation was performed using a liquid nitrogen-based system. It consists of uh, the unit shown here, as well as a cryoprobe that is inserted into the center of the tumor. The cryoprobe is a diameter of about 3.4 millimeters, not centimeters, millimeters. <laughs> I just noticed that. <laughs> and the length of the cryoprobe is 12.5 centimeters. The cryoprobe is inserted in the center of the tumor. Uh, once uh, the uh, system is activated, the cryoprobe freezes to a temperature of min uh, minus 185. Uh, the goal is to ablate a one centimeter rim of tissue around the tumor, which basically gives you an ice ball uh, or an area of treatment that measures somewhere between three to five centimeters in diameter, which is about the same amount of tissue that we remove when we perform a lumpectomy, a typical lumpectomy for a one centimeter tumor. The procedure is typically performed on the ultrasound guidance uh, so that we can direct the, the probe accurately through the center of, the, of a tumor. Uh, we also utilize hydrodissection, which basically involves insertion of a needle between the tumor and the skin so that we can inject saline uh, into that space. One of the considerations in this treatment is that we want to cryoblate the tumor, but not cryoblate the overlying skin. So we can use saline or lidocaine injected between the tumor and the skin to maintain a safe distance between the developing ice ball and the overlying skin. And it's all done real time with the patient awake. As you know, freezing has, has an anesthetic effect or an analgesic effect. So unlike some of the other ablation techniques that use heat, which cause pain, which must be performed under anesthesia, like a sedation or general anesthesia, cryoablation has an analgesic effect, which allows it to be performed in the office, just like they're undergoing a core biopsy for the diagnosis of breast cancer. This is an ultrasound showing a, a, a tumor uh, with the cryoprobe inserted through it. So this is a part of the hypoechoic uh, aspect of the tumor here. Uh, the needle is shown inserted here. This is the same tumor shown in cross-section with the cryoprobe at the center. And just to make it easier to see, that's kind of what the cryoprobe looks like entering the tumor. You only see the front part of the tumor because the, uh, the cryoprobe prevents you from seeing the, the posterior aspect of this spherical tumor. And that's, again, the tumor there with the cryoprobe at its center. This is the ice ball, or what the ultrasound looks like when we are in the middle of cryoablation. An ice ball has formed. The ice ball causes the signal to be deflected away, so we actually don't see the interior of the ice ball. But the tumor would be at the very center of this, and what we're doing is ablating the tumor plus a rim of normal tissue around it. And we can monitor the distance of the ice ball to the skin and inject saline at that location as needed. We also inject it behind the mass as well to protect the underlying chest wall. This is a, a, an image of the publication uh, by, the ACOSA, by the American College of Surgeons Oncology Group. This is the phase two study looking at the role of cryoablation in the treatment of early stage breast cancer. Remember, in this trial, all patients underwent tumor resection. The primary endpoint was to determine whether or not cryoablation was effective at killing the tumor completely. The study's findings are summarized here. For tumors measuring up to one centimeter, Cryoablation was found to be 100% effective. There were no tumors that were still alive at the time of resection four weeks later. For tumors that measured up to including two centimeters, the procedure was 92% effective, which means that some tumors were not completely treated. Uh, it's clear that the smaller ones were, the ones that were slightly larger were not. The question is why? And some of the observations in the study was that multifocal disease did limit the efficacy of the treatment to some degree. There are also some technical challenges with probe placement, which I won't get into. Uh, but the main thing is that if you can target the lesion, target the probe accurately, 
If the lesion is well characterized, which allows it to be targeted accurately, then you should be able to corroborate completely. And that's really the kind of the goal of the trials which followed uh, the ECOSOC study. They also looked at the role of MRI. Uh, MRI was good, but not perfect at assessing whether or not residual disease was present. Uh, there's more, more we need to learn about the role of MRI in the context, but MRI has been incorporated into the FROST trial, which I'll discuss, so that we can continue to study how we can use imaging as a surrogate for resection to document that there's no residual disease. I'd love to be able to share with you the immune response studies, but they just haven't been analyzed and reported out yet. This publication that I just that I'm describing was, was uh, published last year. Uh, I'm not sure when they'll publish data regarding the immune response, but uh, I've been wait, uh, waiting that for a long time. Uh, but what, you know, when I started this conversation and I said I've been cryoblading fibroadenomas, I didn't say that, but I've been cryoblading fibroadenomas since about 2002, I really have not been interested in cryoblading fibroadenomas. For the most part, they need no treatment at all. My goal was really to sort of understand this technology so that I could one day use it as a treatment for breast cancer. Uh, and ideally, one day use it as a, as a standalone treatment for breast cancer without requiring resection. And that was really the, the inspiration, the idea behind my participation in the ACOSOC trial and my work to develop the FROST trial. So I'd like to share with you sort of the rationale for why we, we sort of, uh, uh, sort of have, have embarked upon this this uh, strategy for managing breast cancer. The first thought is that, and the first recognition, and this is really true in the context of personalized uh, medicine, that not all cancers are aggressive, not all cancers may require removal. We should have other ways to treat breast cancers that are less aggressive, especially those indolent cancers that may never grow, spread, or become a problem for a patient. Uh, we have an increasing awareness now that radiation therapy isn't required for all patients. We can administer radiotherapy, we can vary the extent of radiotherapy, as well as determine to eliminate radiotherapy in patients that have a low risk of recurrence. So uh, in thinking about cryoablation as a standalone treatment, it provides us an opportunity to treat a cancer without removing it, without any radiotherapy, if we can choose the right patients and, and the right biology. Another provocative concept is that not all patients with breast cancer require lymph node surgery. That's been our standard of care for a very long time, but we're recognizing that in certain circumstances, and especially in less aggressive tumors, resection of the nodes adds very little benefit or no benefit, but it definitely adds, adds morbidity, and we need to be more selective in how we use it. And then, of course, you have those patients that simply refuse surgery or refuse radiotherapy and lymph node surgery. Do we simply turn them away, or do we find another way to treat them that, that is more appropriate for their risk tolerance? Well, I took sort of those questions into design of the FROST trial, which is, stands for freezing alone instead of resection of small tumors. It's a phase two study, multi-center, uh, that is uh, currently ongoing in the U.S. is sponsored by Sonaris. And the key questions in the FROST trial are the following. Uh, can cryoblation eliminate the need for lumpectomy and radiotherapy in selected patients? Can we use a core biopsy at the six-month post cryoblation time point? Uh, to assess the effectiveness of uh, cryoblation without requiring resection of the tumor to prove that. And number two, can we uh, uh, omit the role, uh, the use of a lymph node biopsy in selected patients that are treated with cryoblation? Uh, in order to design the study, I looked at not only my experience in the ACOSOC trial, but also other published series regarding cryoblation. Some of them are shown here. What you see is that most of them were conducted in, uh, you know, over the last 10 years. Uh, they were mostly were prospective, although there were some respect, retrospective studies. The studies were generally small, 10 to 40 patients, uh, and the cryoblation was performed, for the most part, using ultrasound guidance, although some studies used MRI and CT guidance. The take-home message from all of these studies is the following, that cryoblation, uh, and I should add, all of these studies were resection studies, the patients underwent cryoblation followed by resection. The take-home message from these studies is that cryoblation, in theory, should be an effective strategy for tumors that are small, that are well characterized by imaging and, of course, well targeted, uh, that are uh, caused by uh, invasive ductal carcinoma because some of the cancers, like invasive labular carcinoma, tend to be much more diffuse and much 
much, much more uh, difficult to characterize in terms of the dimensions. So we want to have a tumor type that is well characterized, that's easy to see, where the cells generally are fairly compact, and that's what we see with invasive ductal carcinomas. And of course, there's a problem of DCS, which is often undetectable by imaging. It's, we'll find it under the microscope, but we might not see it on the preoperative imaging. Uh, so we want to make sure that we have patients that have a low burden of DCS, because those are the cancers that are patients that are likely to have residual disease that's not ablated because we've simply missed it because we didn't see it. So the inclusion criteria for the uh, FROST trial is shown here. Based upon the information that I just shared with you, we decided to limit the enrollment to patients age 50 and older with invasive ductal carcinoma, tumors measuring up to 1.5 centimeters, a unifocal tumors that were estrogen receptor and progesterone receptor positive because we wanted to be able to use endocrine therapy as a way to facilitate control of systemic as well as regional nodal disease so that we can eliminate hopefully the need for node dissection in many of those patients. We of course eliminated the HER2 positive breast cancers because they tend to be more aggressive breast cancers. Uh, we limited to patients with, with a low volume of uh, DCS and of course we want tumors that are well visualized by imaging so that you can easily target the cryoprobe into the center of the tumor. Now, in thinking about the design and asking the question, can we eliminate radiotherapy for a significant number of women in the trial, we looked at trials that were already published that addressed that question, that is, whether or not we could admit radiotherapy in the treatment of early stage breast cancer. Uh, the most, uh, I think, important study in this uh, area was this study shown here, CLGB, CLGB 9343, which is a randomized trial of women aged 17 and older with homoreceptor positive tumors measuring two centimeters or less. Patients were randomized to either, uh, let me get the pointer going, to uh, uh, underwent lumpectomy, and then were randomized to radiotherapy or no radiotherapy. Both groups received tamoxifen. So the experimental arm here was the patients that had a lumpectomy followed by tamoxifen but received no radiotherapy uh, compared to those that did receive radiotherapy. And the question was, with the omission of radiotherapy, uh, increased the harm to these patients, or would they do well even without radiotherapy? Another endpoint, actually it was an endpoint, but it was, an op it was a component of the trial, was that surgeons were given the option of whether or not they would require a lymph node biopsy of the patients. It was not mandatory. It was surgeon and, physician, surgeon and patient cho choice. And in fact, two-thirds of the patients in this trial opted not to have lymph node surgery. Only one-third had lymph node surgery. So although that wasn't an endpoint of the study, it did allow us to, to gain some insights regarding the impact of omitting a lymph node biopsy in selected patients, older patients with small tumors that were ER positive that committed to endocrine therapy. This is the summary of the COGB findings. Uh, that when you looked at the primary endpoint, local recurrence rate, omission of radiotherapy did impact the local recurrence rate. Those that had radiotherapy had a 98 percent disease-free survival at 10 years within the breast, that is, local recurrence disease-free survival at 10 years, compared to 91 percent of those that did not have radiotherapy. However, when you look at what's most important, overall survival, disease-free survival, there was no difference in the survival of these two groups. We looked at the axillary recurrence rate, there was a zero versus a 1.5 percent risk of recurrence in the axilla. So the bottom line was that although radiotherapy did have an, an effect on reducing the risk of recurrence within the breast, that risk, which is modest, did not translate into a difference in survival for the patient and opened the door for us to very selectively tell patients over age 70 who were committed to endocrine therapy that they could go forward with lumpectomy alone and tamoxifen or, or neuromatization without requiring breast radiotherapy. But the study also showed us that we could also selectively omit lymph node surgery for these patients as well. And that's the second provocative comp consideration that the, tar that the FROST trial will examine. Now, I say this provocative, but I think because it's provocative to most, but our own society, the Society of Surgeon Oncology, has a campaign now called Choosing Wisely, which advocates that physicians and, 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 and their patients should acknowledge the following, that they do not need to routinely use sentinel biopsy in clinically no women, negative women age 70 and older with hormone positive breast cancer. So that very concept that was explored by CLGB study 
is now being promoted by the Society of Surgeon Oncology so that we can minimize the burden of exterior surgery in patients that receive very little benefit from it. And that's something that uh, we will do in the FROST trial. Now, in the FROST trial, the second question was, well, what about the younger woman? What about the woman under the age of 70? Can we, number one, eliminate radiotherapy in those patients? And number two, can we eliminate lymph node surgery in those patients? I'll very simply answer the first question, radiotherapy, is that no, we ha we're not eliminating radiotherapy in those patients. So radiotherapy is required for women under the age of 70 uh, that, uh, th that receive cryoablation. But we are trying to stratify the younger woman by risk using molecular profiling so that we can say for a woman under the age of 70, if her uh, molecular profiling score shows that she's low risk for recurrence, she could then avoid sentinel biopsy surgery, whereas someone high risk will go on to receive sentinel biopsy, the sentinel biopsy procedure. So I think overall in the trial, a minority of women will end up, end up requiring lymph node surgery because I think most will be low risk or older, uh, but there will be a subset that will require axillary surgery. Uh, and I think, you know, in certain circumstances that will be uh, appropriate. So this is a summary of what I've just shared with you, the schema of the trial. All patients will have cryoablation with no breast surgery. The cryoablation will consist of uh, this, uh, uh, will be performed using this liquid nitrogen-based approach whereby we treat the tumor, freezing the tumor, uh, as well as a one center rim of normal tissue around the tumor so that we have a safety margin to encompass treatment of a tumor that might be slightly larger than anticipated. The treatment involves uh, two free cycle, cycles and one thaw cycle, six for the smaller tumors under a centimeter, six minutes of freeze, followed by 10 minutes of thaw, followed by six, six uh, minutes of freeze. And then uh, once we have a few minutes of thaw, we can simply withdraw the cryoprobe, place a bandage on the uh, puncture site, and send the patient home. For patients with uh, slightly larger tumors, 1 to 1.5 centimeters, it's an 8-minute freeze, 10-minute thaw, 8-minute freeze, and then the same closure, a stereo strip, and we send them home. Total treatment takes about 30 minutes to 40 minutes. Based upon the patient's age, we placed them in two strata, either the stratum 1, which is the older stratum, or stratum 2. Uh, patients in stratum 1, those age 70 and older, uh, do not have any lymph node surgery performed and they do not receive any breast radiotherapy. Patients in stratum 2, however, do receive breast radiotherapy and based upon their molecular profiling signature, they'll be advised to have either no lymph node surgery if they have a low risk score or sentinel biopsy if they have a high risk score. Uh, patients will then initiate endocrine therapy because all of these tumors are hormone receptor positive. It's a requirement to participate in the study. At six months post cryoablation, they will undergo a core biopsy of the cryoablation site. Uh, and uh, this is an ultrasound guided core biopsy with the goal of targeting the original tumor plus any other finding that in the perimeter of the tumor that is of concern. To the, uh, to, the, to the radiologist. So if they see a mass or an area of enhancement uh, you know, outside of the area that was ablated or at the edge of the area that was ablated, they're advised to biopsy that area because we want to know if we have any misses along the perimeter of the tumor, uh, as well as whether or not the tumor uh, itself has been completely ablated. Uh, and assuming that there is no residual, found, residual disease found at any of those areas, the patients would then go on to complete their five years of endocrine therapy, as well as to complete five years of serial imaging consistent of mammography, ultrasound, and MRI at several time points, and that's summarized here. The primary endpoint of the trial is to determine the rate of successful tumor ablation measured at the six-month time point. So six months post cryoablation based upon that core biopsy that will be performed. Secondary endpoints include local recurrence rate within the breast, axillary failure rate, particularly since we're not resecting the axillary nodes in most of these patients, uh, adverse event rate, uh, breast cosmesis, uh, particularly uh, well, specifically using uh, a standardized, a computer-based uh, 
program where we take images of the breasts at various time points and allows the computer to actually make the comparison, not just the surgeons, but the computer does the comparison of breast cosmesis. And then also we want to look at the sensitivity and specificity of um, imaging in assessing the uh, presence of residual disease. Indications for surgery for participants in the trial is, of course, technical failure. If for some reason we can't complete the correlation procedure because of technical failure, or if the patient, due to anxiety or other concerns, is unable to, is unable to complete the treatment. Uh, a second indication for resection is detection of residual disease at the six-month uh, post cryoablation uh, time point, and of course, detection of recurrence within the breast uh, as well is uh, an indication for surgery. Breast or axilla are indications for surgery. At this time point, we have uh, 18 patients enrolled uh, in the study, 17 treated. The first enrolled uh, was in uh, July. The goal is to enroll a total of 210 patients, uh, in, uh, include one, 105 in each arm. Uh, and uh, at the present time, we have several sites uh, enrolling. Those are the sites shown in red. Uh, there were several sites that are in the process of going through the IRB uh, procedures, uh, shown in blue and green. And then there's interest from many other sites uh, shown in yellow. Now, I promise to share with you the data from Dr. Fakuma because in many ways, his work is, is sort of is sort of uh, a good uh, indication for what we should expect. His work is about five years beyond our work, and so I've been watchful, and we're all interested in knowing how his patients turn out because it, it, it gives us an idea of what we should expect here in the States. As I said, his inclusion criteria uh, involved the, uh, included patients with luminal A, which is a low-risk uh, breast cancer. Those cancers are strongly ER and PR positive. All of his patients were treated with sentinel biopsy, although ours will not be. Uh, the patients underwent uh, cryoablation instead of surgery. They all received radiotherapy, not just the uh, younger ones, but they all received radiotherapy, and they all received integrant therapy. A total of 200 patients were enrolled. Uh, the median follow-up of those patients is six years, with follow-up up to 10 years, and he has observed two recurrences out of 250 patients, so less than 1% recurrence rate. There's not a single breast conservation patient that, paper that I've seen that has reported a less than 1% recurrence rate at five years. So this gives me a lot of hope that we're on the right path. Yes, our tumors are not all luminal, luminal A's. We will have some luminal B's as, as well, uh, which are higher risk tumors. We are eliminating radiotherapy for a number of patients, and we're eliminating sentinel biopsy for a number of patients as well. But it tells me that we at least have a, a, a strategy that can be adapted to low risk patients and maybe to some intermediate risk patients that will give them an alternative to traditional lumpectomy, lymph node surgery, and radiotherapy for treatment of breast cancer, especially if that's an approach that they desire, because not everyone wants to have extensive surgery, and some patients don't want to have surgery at all. Now, the last topic that I'll discuss, and, uh, and again, only briefly, is the concept of cryoblation and the immune response to treatment. A significant number of people that come to me expressing interest in cryoablation have heard, I'm not quite sure where, that cryoablation produces immune response and they're coming to me not so much that they want to have the cryoablation, but they want to have the immune response caused by cryoablation. <laughs> and I say that, well, I know we have some preliminary data that suggests that that might be so, but we're just not there yet. So I have to sort of, you know, reel them in because <laughs> uh, they want to have it done, but they want to have it done for a reason that I can't prove really works. But there are some intriguing studies that suggest that that might be the truth. And as you heard from the earlier presentation today regarding radiation oncology, there is a, an, an indication that cryoblation or treatment of the local site may produce an immune response that could benefit a systemic site, uh, and that it's not just a local phenomenon, but a potentially systemic phenomenon. It's called an abscopal effect, that a local treatment produces a systemic benefit. There are two uh, studies that I'd like to show. They were both animal studies uh, that uh, examined the role of cryoblation. Uh, this is one arm of the study. The three arms included uh, these uh, palpsy uh, mice. Uh, one arm was treated, uh, all arms were treated with an injection of uh, MT901 cancer cells. It's a breast cancer cell line. Uh, 
the cells were, uh, the, were allowed to grow within the mice so that they developed breast tumors. And the three arms, arm one, those tumors were treated with cryo ablation. And arm two, they were treated with surgical resection of the tumor. And arm three, they were treated with no, they, were, they received no treatment at all. They just allowed the tumors to grow. And then in each of the three arms of the study, the lymph nodes that drain the injection site were removed and the T cells within those lymph nodes were taken out and examined in culture. And the key question here was whether or not cryoablation versus surgery versus no treatment at all would enable or activate the T cells within the, within the nearby lymph nodes to recognize or to become activated to recognize the, the cancer that was injected at the, at the, uh, within the breast. And this is what the uh, study showed, that when you compare cryoablation to surgical excision versus no treatment, it was the cryoablation group that showed a marked increase in the interleukin expression, the cytokine expression that you heard about earlier, when they're exposed to MT901 cells. So this is cryoablation. This is lymphocytes put in culture alone with no cancer cells. There was no or essentially no interleukin expression. Those that were combined with the original injected cancer cells in MT901 showed a marked increase in interleukin. And T cells that were in the third category here that were combined with line one cells, which are cells that had not been injected, the cancer cells, but they're not, they're different than the MT1 cells. There was no activation of interleukin in those cells. So it basically says that the phenomenon of cryoblation was able to activate T cells that specifically recognize the cancer cells that had been injected at the outset. And that's the immune response we hope to see, that it's a very specific target response that your body has, uh, has uh, induced, uh, or that cryoblation has induced. And that phenomenon was not in, observed in patients that underwent surgical resection of the tumors, and of course it was not observed in patients that had no treatment, or mice that had no treatment at all. These are mice, not patients. Now, the last phenomenon uh, the, the next question that you ask is, well, that's what's happening in the tumor, but what happens systemically? Is there really a, is there a signi signi uh, systemic effect? And that was looked at in a separate study. Again, three sets of mice, all injected with this breast cancer cell line, but the tumors were allowed to grow and metastasize to the lungs. So the mice develop metastatic carcinoma involving the lungs. The question in this study was whether or not treatment of the tumor itself with various medications means would have an effect on the tumors that have already spread to the lungs. So here you have a mouse, you see the pulmonary metastasis in the lung, and in the experiment arm, the patient underwent cryoblation of the tumor, not resection of the tumor, cryoblation of the tumor. In the second arm, they went, underwent cryoblation, of, uh, the, sorry, in the second arm, they underwent removal of the tumor, and in the third arm, they underwent no treatment. Using a similar pattern of, of graphs, this is the result that was observed. That in those patients that had, I'm sorry, mice, mice patients, <laughs> that had no treatment, there was no impact on the number of pulmonary metastasis. That would make sense. And under those, for those that underwent surgical resection, there was a reduction, but still a significant number of pulmonary lesions left in the lungs. But for those that underwent cryoblation, there was a significant reduction compared to the others in the amount of metastatic sites in the lung. So what we're seeing here is what was shown earlier with radiotherapy, that treating the tumor itself, in this case with cryoblation, had the best results in terms of reducing systemic disease in these patient mice. Uh, and uh, that's what excites me most about this. Not about completing the tumor, but about the opportunity that is provided from local treatment of breast cancer, which can gain, you know, potentially a systemic benefit. It's what our patients want, it's certainly what my patients want, but it really is the best opportunity we have in breast oncology to be surgeons that not only control disease locally, but also to control disease systemically. There is a scenario where I envision, that I envision, if we can prove this concept, that even for patients that require surgical resection, we may decide to ablate them first and resect them later, because it might provide an opportunity to induce an immune response that has a systemic benefit, 
uh, regardless of how we ultimately decide to manage a tumor, we wouldn't want to miss this opportunity if, if it's a real thing. And uh, we have a lot of work to do to prove that, but I think from the presentation that I heard earlier today, I'm inspired to commit myself further to this work because I think it's a real opportunity. So in summary, uh, I'd like to conclude by pointing out that you know, I think cryoablation has a promising role in breast oncology. We're, Dr. Fukuma is a few years ahead of us, but if we had those data now in the U.S., I think most of you will be sending your patients to cryoablation without any concern. Uh, but I think in the U.S. we still have to do, do the results, do the research, and that's what uh, the FROST trial allows. Uh, but, you know, the future I think will be, about, will be uh, about the immune system, as it is in so many other aspects of oncology. Uh, and I think the, the greatest promise that cryoblation has is to expand the efficacy of treatment, not just uh, from the local treatment of breast cancer within the breast, to treating uh, breast cancer as a systemic disease. Thank you very much. Thank you.